Hi, I'm Mark Honeybone from Property Ventures and welcome to our podcast where we interview prominent members of the investment community along with other professionals in the New Zealand property market. To check us out, take a look at propertyventures.co.nz. We hope you enjoy today's podcast. Can you hear me? Yes. Can Good. you hear me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're live. So <laughs> no more, no more swearing. <laughs> We're not that bad. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, quick apologies for the slight late start. We had a little technical glitch, but it all seems to be over now. So um, it's a short session today. So let's get going. So for those of you who are new to the association, good afternoon. My name is Serena Gibbon. I'm the general manager of the Auckland Property Investors Association. And with me today is our very good friend, Mark Honeybones, who is a longtime property investor and a real estate agent who owns Property Ventures. For those of you who's been kicking around the industry for a while, you will know Mark as the um, the voice, lovely voice behind the long running, is it the Property Ventures podcast? Which New, I want to say is like New Zealand Property Podcast. New Zealand Property <laughs> Oh, goodness. this is terrible. But you guys would know him. He runs a podcast. He's been doing it since quite well, seven ish years, like, seven years or so. Before maybe podcasts were maybe cool. Eight. Maybe eight. Yeah, before that were cool. Mm -hmm. A very long time. So I will post the details in the chat box during the talk. But we're getting together for a quick half an hour chat today on how to research the developer behind your next project. I know, um, especially in light of interest limitation, more and more of you are thinking about things like buying off the plans or buying new builds um, for that tax benefit, if you call it, if you can call it a benefit at all. And a lot, of, and we've sort of long been tapping into Mark's knowledge base about that new build market. But I want to say um, people like Mark, who's like super entrenched in the market, often talk about how to research, do, do your due diligence and research these developers because you are putting down a lot of money and and with your most of the time not being um, not being a finished product there. You do want to make sure that you're doing everything you can to be um, working with the right partners. And I find the environment is as such in Auckland at least. I'm seeing, you know, even when I'm walking around my neighborhood, I'm seeing more and more development companies um, pumping up out of nowhere with names I've never even heard of. So so I think it, it can be a bit of a confusing um, market for investors. And that's what we want to be talking to Mark about. We've got some pre-prepared questions that Mark is going to answer. And then we're going to hop on over to some of your questions in the chat box if we have time. So before I get going, um, I just want to remind everybody that everything Mark and I are going to be covered today is not intended to be tax legal or financial advice um, with loads of people um, in our network who can provide you with the right advice, including Mark. So if you do want to um, get us to give, lend you a hand and introduce you to the right professionals, feel free to reach out to Pat um, in the office office um, email address. And I'll also pop that in the chat box while Mark is talking. Um, so let's get going with the questions. Just trying to find the questions I sent to you, Mark. <laughs> Very Linux by our tech, little tech hiccup. Do you want me to read out the first question for you, maybe, while you look for the rest? No, no, I got, <laughs> I got it here. So, question number one, let's set the scene. Why is it important to research a developer from the point of view of, do you think it's more important to learn as much as you can about the actual project 
or um, learn as much as you can about the people who are going to develop it. Okay, well, um, thanks, Serena. And it's a good good starting question, that that one. And um, sorry, it's not going to be death by PowerPoint today. I haven't got any, which is unlike me. Um, so you just have to w watch my ugly face and, uh, and, and Serena's pretty face, so there you go. <laughs> um, so we'll start off. For me, my, my opinion is certainly the developer is the most important thing to look for when um, you're looking at a project because the developer is the one who's spending your 600, 800,000, one point whatever million dollars to you know, in what they do. So their, their history is for me is really, really important and I've learned that the longer I've gone in this game, um, the, uh, the the more I've probably I've realised that. Um, so you, so find try to find out the history of the developer. That that's really important, and there's you know, there's various ways to do that. Hopefully they've got their own website, or they can show you, um, and, and groups and people like you know Arpia and stuff. Your people will know know them. But um, questions you want to find out about them is you know what what projects have done. How many is it their first first project? Because every developer I know, and I know some we've sold seven seven lots of property through over the last sort of seven or eight nine years. And they uh, they've learned from every project. So the more they do, the more they they learn. The wiser they get. Maybe the cheaper they can build, and the better products. So they can get better products, and and they'll learn different things. So obviously, the more experience is is um, is good. Um, doesn't say mean that you know, a newer developer can't do a good job. Uh, they might have a lot of skills they bring to the party, and that's why they're going to develop. Um, but they always learn more as they go. Um, so. That's important. You find out or ask them what the you know the, the completed projects are, so you can go and have a have a look at it. Um, nice to actually talk to someone's lived in one of those places, um, but you know, but, but to view, see, view what they've done is really important. Uh, right down here, ask you know other investors that said like this. Even if the developers are small, a uh, newish, should be someone in the game that knows of them. Um, so so do do your research because there is a lot of difference between it. A good developer and a not so good developer. Um, and questions are one of the really, really important questions is find out the history on do they finish somewhere close to expectations or when they expect a time of finish? Because that's one that can really hurt hurt the um either a home buyer or an investor. Uh, like most of you people are. Um, that that's that's a really important one for a, a lot of reasons. And if um you know it's two years late getting finished. That can put troubles on where you are living. Maybe you're renting. Maybe you're you to, you're selling your house and moving somewhere else. Um, for example, was Alexandra Park, which we you know, sold the last thirty five last year, or early this year. Sorry, they um, that that was six years after it started. You know, they had a, immense problems there with twice three at the project, and um, it was sort of about three and a half years late. And I know I heard, heard, heard stories of some people who have sold properties three times in that in that time um, because they thought it was going to be finished you know, earlier um, and then you know people trying to get the timing right with their rents and what have you but that that's really important the other reason for for that is them finishing close to what's expected is their finance and i think i've got to cover later on another question but their finance if they're a, a year late develop uh, finishing and they're lending most of their money they're going to be short a lot of it's going to cost them a lot of money it's, you know, you're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars a month you know interest these some of these people will be paying these developers um, on that mark before you move on on that how how would a buyer get any sort of visibility into how the developers structure the lending and you know to what extent are they building on borrowed money that sort of, can you just ask them yeah, yeah you, you can i mean you can ask someone anything it's just up to them how they how they do i mean the the agent if you're working through an agent they should have an idea of how they how they do it um you know because you know when i ask us for example you know we've we've worked with some people don't borrow any money they're, they're self-funding their projects um we know some others and many people come to us because we can sell before resources sent we'll talk about that shortly but um so you know that, that's a good starting point as the agent if, if you trust them to tell the truth which they should be telling the truth and they have to they, legally they have to do that that anyway now um so but but you know if you're working directly with a developer ask them and you've got a question afterwards about um uh, testimonial we'll talk about that that then so so the yeah being financial is important but um 
yeah, but when they finish close to expectations, really important because they've run out of cash. That then puts pressure on the finish point. Can they finish it? That's another question. Um, and uh, are they taking shortcuts at the end to, to finish it? So, so if you go back, if you're researching a developer and you go look at completed projects, because I think it's really interesting what you talk about expectation versus delivery, right? Actual delivery. So if you're a buyer in this market and you go back to the, the developer's previous projects to look at what did they promise the other customers? What did they actually deliver? Yeah. How do you actually find useful information like beyond just knocking on someone's door and say, are you happy with these, this lot? Like, how do you actually know? Because you weren't the customer, you actually weren't told what they were promising people back then. Yeah, and that's a couple of the questions I've got on the testimonial one, but it's, it's just, yeah, finding finding out someone that has bought from them before. That's simple, and it's, I say simple as that, but yeah, you must be able to find out um, through through somebody or ask, you know, asking them, give, give you three or four customers' name you've sold to before. Um, okay. Um, let's on that. Let's move on to the testimonial question um, because I'm a big fan of reading Google reviews. Yeah. How do you know the testimonial you're getting from another customer is a genuine review? So be it supplied to you by the developer themselves or maybe like just a run of the mill Google review. Yeah. Um, do you validate any of the information? Yeah, no, I've had that before. I had that uh, a reasonably bad experience about gosh, I don't know, a long time ago, 15 years or 16, 17 years ago. And um, I had a, a testimonials that weren't really they were they were friends, and they they weren't they, and I never validated them. I wasn't that experienced, 17, 18 years or whatever it was ago, and um, and yeah, got caught out a little bit with that. So yeah, so yeah, is it a um, is it a genuine re review? You first of all, you all first of all, is talk talk to them. Don't just take a bit of paper as gospel. So in most any testimonial of any worth will have a phone number on it from the, the, the person they you know, sent it to, the, the developer in this case. So make sure you you talk to them. And when you're talking to them, I just wrote down a few questions to ask them, you know, just because you, you can get a gauge on someone if they're fudging what they're saying or if they, they're friends with the developer or not. If you ask it, if you talk enough and ask enough questions, they'll, um, you, if you, you get a pretty gauge you, you know, pretty quickly. And if you ask things like, to start up, well, hey, what's your relationship with the developer? Um, that's just one straight away they may or may not be expecting, but you know, hopefully, hope you're going to get them the client that bought a property from them. Um, you know, how, how did you find out about the developers? That's one in the, in the first case. So, you know, how, how did they find out how to get to them? Was it through word of mouth or was it they're a big brand or whatever? Um, you know, why did you use them? I think that's a good question because that's still say, why did you use them ahead of someone else? They were cheap and nasty, or they obviously they got good, they you know, they finish on time, they, they do this, um, what, what have you. And um, the questions I said before about um, did the did they finish somewhere within you know and I say within six months of I'll talk about that shortly but within six months of expected time of finish is okay, is okay you don't be any longer than that but um, that's a question you should all also ask and, and then and then Google you know Google both your names together Google the developer's name and and the person the testimonials from why not you get quite interesting what you get sometimes and they here is an article or something with with both your names it'll it'll pop up. Um, and uh, so that that's uh, so that as far as the testimonial whether it's genuine or not, that's um, yeah, that's that's sort of uh, probably all I can really add to add to that. Apart from try try to try to find your own somehow. That's the other other thing. Oh, you've just uh, gone quiet. I can't hear you for some reason. I haven't touched anything. Rookie mistake. <laughs> I always forget to turn the microphone back on. Oh, Sorry about that. Yeah. When you talk to previous customers, um, do you? Do you kind of rely? Do you do you differentiate between feedback from homeowner buyers versus feedback from other investors? Do you care about that differentiation, or is it just more? Are you more interested in sort of finding out about their, ex, their general experience throughout yeah. the entire development? Mainly just the general experience. Um, the only reason I perhaps talk to a developer might be is that you usually provide a rental appraisal. And hey, did they get the rent? They were, you know, they were promising all the the, the rental appraisal had. Uh, I know a lot of people think rental appraisals are, are pretty high sometimes from developers. I've actually, you know, to tell the truth, most developments I've done have actually come back 
getting more than they've actually had on the rental appraisal. Probably more now that we're a bit more conservative the rental appraisals these days. But okay. that's really the only difference I'd be asking a, an investor over a home homeowner. It really, it's not really as, as important, I don't think. But uh, and, and then you can ask them if they've got someone else. Do they know of anyone else that's that's used that company before? That's another okay, question. fair play. I think hey, listen on rental appraisal that just leads really well to the next question about marketing languages now. I don't really know if it happens a lot in the sort of development space, but I, for, you know, I think as a, just a general consumer, for example, sometimes I find marketing languages really can be really misleading. It's a bit like now we are all learning that all these, all, there's no definition on green and sustainability, all that eco sort of, you know, sustainability orientated marketing language, really, if, if you look into it, a lot of them mean nothing. So. Is there like a comparable challenge in the new build development space? Are there on the glossy magazines or websites these days? Do you see any sort of common marketing language? And can you maybe do like a layman translation for us? Yeah, in fact, I just actually, now I'm looking at it, I actually didn't really see the marketing language. I've actually written down quite a few things here, and I probably should have had a PowerPoint maybe for this this, part, this one question. <laughs> because I've got quite a lot of things in here. I didn't actually look for the marketing. I've actually looked more of terms, terms commonly. <laughs> use terms but they'll they'll be with both but um so i'll go through what i've got so i think that's quite an important because they're all important things some people would have heard me talk about some of these before some wouldn't have heard me talk about any of these before uh, or most wouldn't have um off so first of all off the plans obviously before code of compliance is com completed and in fact off the plan that's just what just it's important to understand that because that's actually changed during this year too um it used to be six months from when code of compliance was issued um, when a place become become a property sort of thing just like now if you buy off the plans you can get your 20 80 percent lending um, that has to be within um, one one year it used to be six months but it's now one year I believe from from when code of compliance was issued so off the plan is before code of compliance is issued so and that's when what we sort of talked about today is off the plan build sort of thing we just established that um, a few few terms I mean quite a few of you heard me talk about sunset clauses before um uh, so sunset clauses in two, two parts and I'll, i won't spend too long on it because i have with other people before there's you can either have it for the vendor or you can have it for the purchaser you as a purchaser don't you don't really want to have the, the um the one for the vendor you want the purchaser one and this will say we're starting a place now it should be finished and the developer thinks it's going to be finished in just a year from that today this first of december next year that's when it's scheduled to finish a sunset, a good sunset clause will be at least six months after that. So say the 1st of June, 2023. And for the purchaser side, it will mean if it's not finished by the 1st of June, 2023, we as a purchaser has a, a choice of either um, getting that deposit, canceling the agreement, getting that deposit back and walking away so we haven't lost anything. Um, or or you can just, um, Carry on and still still buy the property, and usually it's gone up. So you want to you want to carry on, but you know, many people cancelled for it. That was under a park after being four years late, um, or during that time. So you it's going to be waiting a long time. So that's that's it for the purchaser. The one you don't want is one for the vendor, and this is what used to happen years ago. It still happens a little bit, not as much these days. And that's where um, due to the same situation, if it's not finished by one June two thousand twenty three, the vendor, the developer can pull out of the um, the deal and cancel all agreements and give all the deposits back. And why that's bad, and it used to have bad rep 15 sort of years ago, is because people would um, just even look at this, this year, for example, it's a classic example. A year ago, an apartment might be worth $700,000, it's now worth $850,000. So the developer might go, if they're, if they're sneaky, you know, I don't care, I'm just going to let it go for another six months. I'm not going to get code of compliance, I'm not going to cancel all those agreements that. At 700, and I'm going to sign another whole lot up at 850 and make 150k plus 20 apartments or whatever. Now, that doesn't happen a lot these days, um, but it used to. It does happen though. Like, I have heard not not often, but since the interest limitation thing was announced, I had heard a few here and there of developers exercising their sunset rights to cancel. Yeah, they, they haven't. I've seen uh, one do it by mistake. I've seen um, people can, um, say, well, can we cross it out? And I've said, yes. Um, I don't really like getting with contractors that or developers that, that have that, that do that. Mm -hmm. This one thing not to get confused with is is um, this I'm all, all for, 
if the developer is um, one of the conditions uh, they haven't got resources and sent yet. And so some, a lot of the developers, they might not be over that financial, but they're obviously financial enough to do the job, you'd hope. And that's where the history comes to history comes in is very important, is when they have to get some pre-sales for finance and they have to get resource consent. Now that might take six months. So you might be starting today, signing the contract, and you might be dating six months from now, 1 June 2022, next year, that says they will, the vendor has to have uh, resource consent and have have a, whatever pre-sales or bank funding will be sufficed, bank funding by the 1st of June. That's not a sunset clause in two years, years year and a half time. That's a clause that means, hey, they might not get resource consent. We had one for the first time ever early this year that, that didn't get resource consent, which is really very sad. But um, so, yeah, so, so that they have to do that because they can't get resource consent. You can't buy a property. So you don't want a contract that's going to tie it up. So all that's doing is once that contract, once that that date comes and that clause has been satisfied, the develop, development's definitely happening. They've got the money. But they've got the um, resource set that's, that's been built. So that's that's not a sun. So just I want to just add that in because it's a difference of a, yeah. not a concept clause. So um, and that's something all we something to do with prior resource consent or what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably enough on 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 that. Um, uh, not always an advertising. Sometimes you might see it deposits in in stakeholder. Um, people get worried about the deposits because it doesn't sit in a real estate company normally or a a trust account um, on New Zealand real estate. Uh, it's, there's a stakeholder on a sale and purchase contract. That stakeholder is a vendor's solicitor, and deposits go to that vendor's solicitor's trust account. That's a legal place. The only way it could not be safe is if he ran away, took it, and went to prison, sort of thing, I guess. Um, it's a, as, as safe as your money will be in, anywhere, maybe except for a bank. Um, so that's just, a, 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 I think, something to sort of realize. Uh, more and more. These days, it was a thing five years ago I never heard of, was a difference between resident society and body corp. And that might be an advertising, you might be a resident society and you go, what the heck's a resident society? Most people know what a body corp is. It's a, well, so it's a cheap version of a body corp. Um, a, a, you know, body, the body corp will, could be anywhere from two to $10,000, uh, looks after insurances and all the maintenance. So, so when I say insurance, building insurance, you don't need build house insurance, so you do when you buy a house. Um, but you, it, it's all, all expense, all the maintenance costs, lift maintenance, the, the gardens, the rubbish, all, all those sorts of things are all taken in there. Cleaning, cleaning the building once a year or the windows, if some, someone comes here and locked down and clean the outside of my, inside of my outdoor windows or on the deck sort of thing. So that stuff gets covered by the, you know, the body corp. So it's usually a little bit pricey, but it's for the best of the, building and hopefully it's a long-term maintenance fund and that does painting and if anything, any dramas happen later on, it's all covered. Um, the the resident society is pretty well, it's a small fund, could be anywhere from $300 to $1,000 a year and it just covers things like communal rubbish and um, and there may be one or two other maintenance type things but that's very, very minimal. But uh, So a lot of people, if it's a unit title, has to have a um, a body corp, if it's a, a lot of places come out now, the freehold, it might be uh, six in a row, six terrace houses, and um, they don't have a body corp, but they'll have a resident society. But uh, it doesn't, you, you, it's a, the, the bad thing is it's your, your, you're responsible for your your cladding and your outside of your building and the, everything. So it's your problem, not your friends, <laughs> your neighbours' problems as well. Do you, um, do you care about things like master's builders, master builders guarantee, what's it called? Do you care about yeah. things like that? Well, I've, I've got that in here because it's one of the things they they do. They have a um, they have a um, most will come with a ten year master bill guarantee, or some don't come with a master bill guarantee, but, but they'll have some ten year guarantee. If I um, understand is correct, is all all products that a developer uses or the the, the builders that, that use it or whatever they do. They, they, all the products come with a 10 year guarantee anyway. So everything that's been built from the exterior right through to the, you know, whatever it is in the, in the place has, has a 10 year guarantee. But do have a look because there is a difference between a master bill guarantee. Some people don't say it's not worth the money. It's, you know, it's uh, the, the paper it's been printed on. Shouldn't say that loud, but some, some will think that. 
Um, others won't touch anything unless it's got a master bill guarantee. So I'm not saying what's mm -hmm. right or wrong. I personally just, I don't really mind either way. Um, as long as I know all the products are, are there for been guaranteed for 10 years, that, that's pretty good with me. Um, and because the other thing that will come, so that that's one thing it comes with. And also it might say in the contract comes with a maintenance or comes with a, um, um, a maintenance period. It might even be in the advertising, you know, free maintenance period. Mm -hmm. or whatever. Now that, that every contract should have that. And there'll be three or six months. And um, that's just if the you know, new things when you build on bulk don't always work. Um, the water might not go, it might be a blockage somewhere or so. Um, that's just important. So that's just little things and the developer should always be um, there, you know, making sure that happens. And you soon learn the difference between a good and bad developer too. If uh, it does under a park, for example, the troubles they've had to be fair, uh, um, the maintenance staff, they, they get there and they just fix, they know it's going to happen and they've got people on the game, they've got a full-time manager there fixing up stuff that gets goes wrong. Um, okay. so hey, yeah, guys, before I move on to my next question, just want to put out in the last call, if any of you have any questions, feel free to pop it in the chat box. I am going to push the end time of the session out to like another by like five, 10 minutes because we did start a little bit late. So the only thing, the only comment I can see on here is from Ed basically saying that we're late. All right, Ed. <laughs> so if you guys have any questions, please feel free to pop it in the chat box. Now, Matt, um, going back to about like the whole Googling people's names and stuff. Um, do you care if you Google a developer's name and then it, it shows up things like they were previously bankrupt? Do you care about things like that? Um, I'll, I'll uh, certainly take it into consideration. I won't. Um, what, what I've got here is uh, you go certainly Google them. Don't take a one-off comment on Google or <laughs> wherever you're looking as gospel of that. That's what it is because some people have heard of some people where they've had this one person said a whatever experience with them and then they're a bit psycho and they'll go on there and they do a whole lot of stuff by the one person. Yeah. If you've got several comments like that or if they've um, you know, been in the media a lot for bad reasons or whatever, you need to take things into consideration sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Also, though, it depends on what they are. If something happened back in 20 years ago and then you see a whole lot of positive comments in the last 20 years or 15 years or whatever, um, I'm one, I guess, of take things into consideration. I don't just look at one thing and switch off. I'll, I'll look at the, all the information together. But yeah, but um, certainly do though, because that, that is very, very relevant. And the squeaky clean, really good developers, they they don't have a whole lot of bad stuff written about them on the internet. If anything, they'll have some positive stuff written about them, hopefully. So um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's that's my sort of, my, my call on that, that question. Okay. Um, now, my final pre prepare question really stem out of uh, a few comments that um, some RP members who I'm friendly with sort of just, you know, threw at me very, very casually about a very well-known developer that's operating in Auckland. And they were like, oh, you know, looked up the family, looked them up on social media because that's how you stalk people these days. And just really getting the sense that um, the people operating this development company do not necessarily live the sort of lifestyle or the way they depict their lifestyle on social media is perhaps uncomfortable for for sort of some RPA members who who think who sort of still hold on to what they think to be very traditional middle New Zealand values and um, and on that basis they, they sort of gave me the impression that they're they don't really want to be doing business with this development company at all. And I just thought it's really interesting um, that there is this, people sort of look through the lens of not just pure numbers on the paper, but also looking for partners who share their values, at least on the surface. Mm. So yeah, just interested in your perspective on that sort of stuff, because you are the sort of person who holds on to a lot of that middle New Zealand value. As well. Yeah, yeah, I am, and probably I've got to give a funny answer, probably because what you think of um, maybe about me or <laughs> whatever. But I, I, I do care immensely about the people who I, who I deal with day in day out, and um, have strong values with with who I use with that. And I think you think you are you are too. What I know about you, and and um, so that that's really important <laughs> for for me. Um, however, not everything in life you have to like the people who's doing doing a job for you. 
Um, you don't have to be, they don't have to be like you or, or what have you. And there's some, some pretty flashy uh, developers out there <laughs> all over the net doing what they're doing. Um, I know some people don't, don't like them. Um, one, 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 one of them at the moment, I, I, I know them, I knew them when they first started, very young, very successful. Um, uh, there's, there's, but there's a lot of others that are out there that are very flashy. Some are just, you never see them on the social media. They, they just, they do this stuff and they're very, very good developers and what have you. Uh, for me, it, it, neither of them really matters for me. I, I, don't, I actually don't care that I'm not living with them. I'm not doing anything with them. I'm buying a property from them. What I care about is do they build a good product? Do they build what I want? I've asked all those questions. It was the first you know, question you asked me how to find out about you know what they like. And um, do they do they build a good product? And, and and more as important, do they finish on time roughly? And if the answer is yes to that, I don't let my my uh, my inner needs or really bother me. I might sit there and go a bit flashy or whatever. Um, but I also just if, if I you know if any one of those companies or whatever I wanted to use, I'd still use them just because they don't yeah. make the same values that I as I do, as long as they're not doing anything, you know, highly illegal sort of thing. Um, yeah. If I don't like them, then it might be a little bit different. But, um, but I want to make sure my money's safe. I want to make sure they're good developers, the money's safe, and it's, uh, it's going to get a, a product pretty close to what, you know, what we um, I asked for and, and, yeah, what what it get. So that's my call. That's that really one. interesting. Yeah, that's a really interesting perspective because i, I got to be honest with you. I really went back and forth, like Pat and I went back and forth to decide whether we want to put this question to you or not. I don't want to be flippant about this forum. Um, but at the same time, I also think to me, when I when I when someone comes to me and asks me something like that, my my angle tends to be about trust. So for me it's like if you're the sort of person who finds it easier to build trust with somebody mm -hmm. who you identify with, then that yep. makes a long-term relationship, which a lot of times is what buyers find themselves in, is in a long-term relationship with yep. the developer. That makes that relationship, just puts it in a good condition to run smoothly. But if you're mm -hmm. the sort of person who sort of tends to be a little bit, um, you know, less trustful or would like to look under the hood a little bit more with yeah. people you yeah. don't click with from day one, then even if there are issues with the development and it's not the developer's fault, I think, you know, you just have to check yourself, check your biases and make sure that you're not looking for problems that are not there because mm -hmm. a lot of times I think the way we, the way we tackle difficulties and complications really has a big effect on the outcome um so on that basis i thought you know it'd be really interesting to see your views of it because yeah frankly, the only thing, the only the only thing really bothers me was with some um bigger developers who, who are very very out there at the media and also we'll call them flashy for a, for a word and um if or we know if something goes wrong down the track one day they they're the ones that don't look very and people don't take too light, you know, too kind of um, when things don't go wrong. Rather than the acquired investor, we've you know developed. We worked with one of them, Hamilton, for many for many years off and on. You, never in the media, you never see them. Um, build fantastic products. They they um, don't need any funding, and they just go along and do their stuff, sort of thing. So if, if something happened there and went wrong, you'd probably be a bit more lenient, or not lenient is the word, but you know you, you take it better, I guess, than <laughs> than um, someone like that. But everyone everyone's to their own, and as you know. Um, I, I can still trust people. I don't know, might not necessarily like their lifestyle, or what they do, but I, I will still trust them. Um, and if I do that, they will still, you know, do business with them. We're all different people, yeah. and it'll be the same. Um, yeah. It's a bit boring world. No. All, all like me, all like you, all like whatever. But yeah. fair enough. You're obviously a much less judgmental person than I am. Um, <laughs> I really like Kelvin's question. Let's wrap up today's session with that one. Um, so Kelvin wants to know beyond the developer, he wants to know, you know, some tips on how to find out more about the actual construction company the developer is using. So how do you as a buyer know which construction company they're using and whether the products they use, um, the materials are good quality and the, the final products of good quality? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good good question. And of course, it's probably too, well, no, the developer's very, very important to find out about them first of all, but yeah, they aren't building it. They've got a construction. Well, some, some are, some have got their own construction companies and some of the big ones do. 
but yeah, so so the way to find out is ask ask them. You, you can ask the developer, who, you know, who, who's building it. You walk in the showroom, Alexandra Park. Um, it tells you who's the who's the architect, who's the develop, uh, the builder, and what what companies do it sort of thing. And then from there, you do the exactly the same thing I said with the developers. You go and check their work and and you know who they are. And most developers who do regular do a lot of stuff. They they use the same the same have the same building gangs and what have you as, as it goes through. Um, so that, that's sort of from them. That we on the sale and purchase agreement, it, it should have the products and stuff they use. Let's do the second part of that question. Um, just just one thing on the sale and purchase agreement. Just go on from that question. Is, is it comes on a, a, a term called substitute materials, and and my thing, why is that in a contract or whatever? And that's because they are going to use this material, this material to do this job, but. As happens, sometimes things uh, you can't get that material. They they run out from where they get it around the world or in New Zealand. So sometime they might have to substitute with a, a, a like, but it is a like for like thing. It's not going to be um, the most expensive going to be all cheap or the other way around. So that's um, that, that's the, yeah, just one extra sort of thing there, I guess. And one, one, cool. one other yeah. I want to go to the other one. So no, that's that's sort of the, one other thing. Go on, finish. I was just going to say it's not really it's just one thing. I just picked up in the sale and purchase agreement before the year year of development and just confuse it. It gets people. Well, the only reason I want to mention is I've never seen it used before ever, but it's in almost every new build contract because it covers a developer, and um, it has the area of development. And what go? What are they talking about? And it and it goes on about if if. if you got the plans, what it all this is, what it's going to look like a hundred square meter, two bedroom place. Um, if it's a five percent more or five percent less, the price can actually, um, of the dimension, the, the price can go up or down five percent. That scares people go, Oh, the developer's got in there, but it's a dodgy thing or whatever. Um, occasionally, t you've, I've heard of um, after consent's been granted or something, something's happened and and whatever on that block of land. Where you can't build exactly what it is, they might have had to modify it slightly, and it might be five percent less or five percent bigger. Um, I've never seen that rule being activated yet, um, but and hopefully I don't. But it's just it's something there. It's not it's not a dodgy clause in there, <laughs> but it's just a wee bit more education for someone out there. It's an every new build contract, and um, you know, as I say, the price could go up or down five percent, or if it's more than five percent bigger or smaller than the plans have on your on your agreement. So um, there you go. <laughs> Um, quick yes no question. Are you and I know it's not obviously not asking you for financial advice, but are you aware if beyond what you do, um, what your own due diligence is as a buyer, whether the banks or lenders would require some kind of sign off for based on the developer's history before they lend you the money? Uh, I read that other banks too. They, they have their own internal checks they do, and I'm sure that they it's a good one for Chris Peterson, but I'm sure they will definitely do their their homework because they do they do a lot of homework now in the background uh, with your money so and of course the other thing with um not really today's topic but, um you just you, you can only get finance for up to six months anyway but and of course a lot of these offer plans are 12 months down the track so you just got to be make sure your situation is not going to get any worse than it is now yeah cool um thank you so so much you've done so many talks for us this year and no, that's I good. Think this is last one. Or, what else do you do when we locked uh, up for four months? I know, uh, <laughs> but I hope to see you sometime this summer. Um, so, hey guys, thank you so much for um, you know keeping Mark and I company today while we talk about how you research a developer. If you are really into that new build, um, new new build space, and you are also beyond buying from um, development companies, you're also interested in rolling up your sleeves and building them, to, um, building a few yourself. Um, just so you know, this evening I'm getting together with Chris Peterson and David Whitburn to talk about how you transition from a traditional buy and hold investor to a build to hold investor so how do you like level up what you're doing with property i think that one is going to be super fun and a slightly more formal than this format as well um beyond that uh happy last day of level three yes <laughs> no um, more level no more levels from tomorrow the levels are gone no more levels from oh my god no more levels from midnight so very very excited i hope everyone is looking after themselves and happy having a very very happy week and mr mcknight if you are 
still on the stream? <laughs> Take care, guys. Thanks, Mark. I'll talk to you offline. Yep. See you all later. And uh, Merry Christmas to everyone. So, all good. Bye. Bye.